So despite having learned to love God and love others and to serve the church, my deepest hurt remained in the area of provision and money. But God is so faithful that he was willing to spend 10 years to heal me from my deepest hurt. And the, the healing was in the form of teaching me one Bible verse. And that verse is Micah chapter 6, verse 8. God taught me in money terms what it meant to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with Him. And I'd love to take this opportunity to share with you what happened in those three distinct episodes. So in 2005, for the first time in my life, I heard a full-length sermon on tithing. And my pastor quoted Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, which basically says, God allows us to test Him in this area. God says, try me in this if in, in basically god is saying if you bring your pre-tax gross income 10 percent of that to the church where you're worshiping at then just watch i will bless you so much that i will open up the heavens and pour down so much blessings on you that you will not be even you won't even be able to handle it so i took that as an opportunity to go slowly, go at my own pace, because God says it's a test that I can try, right? So, and this is the only area in the whole Bible where God invites you to test Him. So immediately, I filled out an auto pay form. Um, and on that auto pay form, I filled out 1% of my base salary for that month, knowing that basically it's, it won't move the needle. So that month went by, didn't move the needle. I changed the auto pay instruction the next month. I upped it to 2% on my base salary. Again, that didn't hurt at all. So by the third month, I changed it to 5%. So third month went by, that was a little harder, but still it didn't, didn't really hurt that much. So by the fourth month, I changed it to 10% of my base salary. And after that, I was patting myself on the shoulder saying, well done, Roger, you're now a, you're now a, you're now a great steward. Um, every time I sense uh, any kind of spiritual pride, God would then teach me the next uh, uh, leg of the homework. A few months later, it was bonus time. And when I saw the number, I was like, <gasps> am I supposed to tithe on this also? And added complexity was the fact that Part of, part of it was in cash, and that's easy because once it's in your account, you can do whatever with it. But the other, but the other part was in shares, and I did not have um, the ability to sell those shares for a few years. So I confess that initially, I had some muddled prosperity gospel thinking. Now, what do I mean by that? Initially, that year, I tithed on the cash amount of the bonus, and also on the shares that I didn't have access to. What I was thinking was, well, God, if I pre-tithe on these shares, now I'm not being greedy. I'm not asking you for, for the shares to take off, you know, two, three, five times, but at least would you give me a floor of protection on the share price such that it won't tank? Shortly thereafter, I found out that God doesn't work this way and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the share price went down. So it took me basically two years to learn how to tithe properly. And I would basically only tithe the stock portion when it becomes vested, i.e. When, when it's in my control, that when I can sell those shares. I would take the stock value upon vesting date and then give the 10% based on that. So now why do I say that this is learning to act justly in, in money terms? In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, God was very angry. God said to man, you're robbing me. And then lowly man says to God, well, you're God, how can I rob you? God said, you, by not tithing, you are robbing me of what belongs to me. So I justified that tithing is the absolute bare minimum 
that we have to do in order to act justly towards God in money terms. So by 2007, I was again filled with spiritual pride, knowing that I was tithing a good amount. And, um, and then God teaches me the next leg of the homework, which is to love mercy. One Sunday, my pastor said to me, well, there's a brother at church. He's got some money problems. I'd love you to sit down with him and have a chat. So I go to the pastor's office, expecting there will be other people there that the pastor would have invited to help solve this problem. But no, my pastor only invited me. So the three of us sat in his office. I had seen this brother around before at church, but I've never spoken to him before. This was his problem. He borrowed three years worth of his wages from a loan shark. And the loan shark threatened to harm him bodily if he could not repay the full amount in 72 hours. Now I thought, well, God brought me to this situation to help. And sure enough, if I choose to help this person, they won't default on any of my loans, right? This is done at church in, you know, in front of my senior pastor as a witness. I was so naive, I didn't even think that there was a remote chance of this person defaulting on me. Now, given the, given the lack of time to find other people to help out in the situation, I only asked this brother three due diligence questions. I said, the money that you borrowed, is this for drugs? He said, no. I said, second question, the money that you borrowed, is this for gambling? He said, no. I said, the last question, is this the full amount that will basically bail you out, that will redeem your life? He said, yes. So I didn't know the Old Testament all that well back then, but the structure that I came up with, a Levitical priest would have gone check, 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 check on all the details. So this is what I did. I lent him the full amount. I charged him no interest. And I said to him, let's arbitrarily set the repayment over five years, over 60 monthly installments. Take the full amount, divide that by 60. Please let me know if this amount is affordable to you. And he said, yes, yes, yes. Um, this is so generous of you, absolutely no problem. So, and I was so naive. I thought that, well, your only opportunity cost is you won't be able to invest this money for an average duration of two and a half years. And, uh, but I'm sure you've earned some brownie points, you know, upstairs. So, you know, let's, let, let's, let's just do that. Repayment was super timely for the first two years. Every first Sunday of the month, I would receive an envelope from this brother and, uh, and everything was fine. But he stopped repaying me after two years. Now, the most interesting decision he made after he stopped repaying me was the fact that he still attended my church. So every Sunday, I would see him. And every now and then when I, when I saw him, there would be some negative emotions that would arise in my heart. I would start to wrestle with myself in my, in my heart. Do I have the right to be angry? Do I have the right to sit him down and ask him what's going on with the loan repayment? And if so, with what kind of attitude can I speak to him? And uh, as I was debating all these issues in my heart, I became more familiar with the Bible and the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18 really spoke to me. In a nutshell, I am like, I I'm like the unmerciful servant where a king lent me, let's say, a trillion dollars. He asked for repayment. I, I couldn't repay it. I begged for mercy. He actually forgave me of my debt. And then I have a, I have, there's another person I lent $500 to. He couldn't repay. He asked me for forgiveness. But instead of forgiving him, I choke him and I throw him into jail. And then that's how I get into trouble with the king. So if I chose to be nasty to this brother, then basically I will be inviting Jesus to be nasty to me. Now that's not very clever, right? So I decided that I cannot give him any dirty looks. I cannot badmouth him behind his back. 
and I just let it slide. So much time had elapsed, and I still remember vividly one day exactly where I was standing at church. I heard a voice from God audibly for the first time in my life. The Holy Spirit asked me this, when did you lend money to this brother? So much time had elapsed, I, had, I actually had to whip out my Blackberry and look through the calendar, and then it took me about maybe half a minute to answer the question. I said, God, I lent money to this brother in 2007. That day was in the year 2014. At that point, I became much better versed with the Old Testament of the Bible, and I realized instantly why God chose to speak to me directly for the first time that day. It was the seventh year, and in the Old Testament of the Bible, the seventh year is the year of debt forgiveness. So essentially, God was asking me, are you willing to obey me and cancel this debt with his brother? I justified that if the maker of all heaven and earth chooses to speak to me directly for the first time, and if I don't respond favorably to his request, then that's basically like showing him no face. Now that's not very clever, right? So I decided right there and then to rip up the, the ticket with my brother. And I told him, our debt is canceled. You don't owe me anything anymore. I'm very pleased to report that he and I are very good friends today and that he has blessed me and my family in a lot of different ways. This seven year story, I think loosely fits into the schematic of learning to be merciful with money. And then again, I was filled with spiritual pride. I was tithing and full, and now I could even lend to someone and cancel the debt at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I must be a good steward now, right? And then God shows me the third leg of the homework, which is to walk humbly with him. At the end of 2014 in December, I suffered from panic disorder or uh, anxiety attacks. And the reason, it was over money. So immediately I knew I had not arrived. If I were such a good steward, then money should not phase me and let alone throw me into panic disorder. What happened was since January that year, Every month in 2014, I had negative cash flow, which meant that my expenses exceeded my income. Ever since I learned how to tithe properly in full in 2007, my income level just kept going lower and lower and lower and lower. So forget about prosperity gospel, at least it didn't work for me. And yet, there were expenses each month that I refused to um, adjust downward. For, for instance, monthly support for my parents and monthly support for my grandmother. And then on top of that, in end of 09, Sylvia and I got married, we bought our home, Danielle arrived in 2011, and then Enoch was born in 2014. So our expenses just went increasing. So I think it is this hole, this cash flow, basically this negative cash flow that I was staring at in December 2014, that triggered my panic disorder. So I prayed to God, I said, Lord, I'm not being greedy, but can you please give me a bonus on an after-tax basis such that I could balance my expenditure for the year? God is super faithful. That's exactly how big of a bonus he gave me. On an after-tax basis, I was able to break even for the year. But I was also thinking, God, is this how you want me to live going forward? This kind of sucks. I hate being in a negative cash flow. Right around the same time, my pastor said to me, well, we probably don't teach enough about stewardship and generosity on Sundays, so why don't you go and find a course uh, that you can offer to the congregation? And so I brought in the Crown Financial course and there, the, at the very first lesson, the guest lecturer quoted one Bible verse, and that Bible verse helped me to realize what I had been doing wrong all these years. That verse is Psalms 24 verse 1, which essentially says, everything in the world and everyone in it, it all belongs to the Lord. 
My problem is that I was on a revenue split model with God. $100 of income comes in, the first 10 is yours, Lord, and then the other, the other 90 is mine. How I save it, spend it, invest it, that's my business, thank you very much. Now, there's probably nothing more foolish one can do because God taking care of us is one of the biggest promises in the whole Bible. We were not designed to strap on this kind of anxiety and burden on our own shoulders. All we have to do is to trust and obey in Him. Of course we have to work, but even our ability to generate wealth comes from Him. And this is reminded um, to us in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, that even the ability to make money comes from God. So if he had chosen to take away a single heartbeat, breath, if he took, took away my education, any of my opportunities, I wouldn't have the chance to own anything. So everything really belongs to God. I discovered my true identity. I'm not only his child, whom he loves so much, I'm just his steward. I'm just his custodian or fund manager. I don't actually own anything. I came naked from my mother's womb and empty-handed, I'm going to leave. So everything is just temporary um, uh, custodian of, of the things that I have. And what God asks of me is not so much whether I can become a chairman of a listed company or become a managing director or partner of my firm or make a lot of money because he cares, he does not care about that at all. Rather, what he cares about is my posture. Do I humbly realize that everything comes from him and I'm receiving everything empty hand, open-handedly from him? And he's going to place one, two, or three people that are less well-equipped to help themselves. The KPI is whether I'm willing to use these resources to freely help them. They are also God's children. Jesus also died for them. And if God sees me do that, then he will see that I'm a safe pair of hands and he's going to bless me, bless me with even more resources because in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, God promises that he will make sure that we can be generous on every occasion. So this was my 10-year healing journey on my identity.